So today we're going to finish up um, what you started talking about on Friday, which is breath first search or BFS, um, specifically talking about how to reconstruct the path once you eventually find the node that you were searching for. And then we'll talk about Dijkstra's algorithm, which is a really, it solves a really important problem with graphs, which is, okay, so we can find a path, which is depth first search. We can find the shortest path in terms of the number of edges, which is breadth first search. But can we find the least cost path uh, in terms of edge weights? So we'll talk about Dijkstra's. And then there's another algorithm that we'll start talking about today, which is called A-star, which is basically like a new and improved version of Dijkstra's. So it runs a little bit faster. OK. Um, so hopefully this looks somewhat familiar from Friday um, with breadth first search. It didn't all uh, disappear over the weekend. But the idea behind breadth first search is you're storing all the nodes you're looking for in a queue. Uh, and then every time you see a new node, you mark it as visited, and then you look at all of its neighbors. The main difference I wanted to talk, to, uh, talk about today is if we have this queue of vertices, you're never going to be able like, OK, so I happen to see this vertex, but that's not a good way to reconstruct this path. So in order to do that, we can keep track of the previous for each node. So you know, um, A's neighbors are B, E, and D. So we would say that their previous was A, and go from there. If you're trying to search from, you know, A to F or something. Um, so that's the big difference. Uh, you will be implementing this on your homework, so I don't want to give away too many of the details about how you can keep track of this. But um, just think, you know, maybe how I should be keeping track of each node's previous uh, when I'm doing this algorithm. Cool. Uh, some good observations about breadth first search are um, it's always going to find the shortest number or the shortest path in terms of number of edges, which if the graph is unweighted, it will be the optimal cost. Though as we'll see with Dijkstra's for weighted graphs, this might not be the least cost path. One difficulty is that it's harder to reconstruct the actual sequence of edges that you traversed in your path. So with DFS, it was really easy because we just you know, kept track of a vector of uh, vertices. But in BFS, you'll have to put a little bit more thought into reconstructing that path. Uh, depth first search uses less memory because it doesn't have that whole queue. Um, and it's a little bit easier to reconstruct the path but BFS finds the shortest path. So there are just some trade-offs um, that you might want to think about if you ever are told, OK, you just need to find a path between two vertices. Okay. Um, what questions do you, all have, do you all have about BFS before we move on to Dijkstra's? Oh, and one last thing, um, if anybody is curious, I will talk about the runtime. It's basically you travel each edge once and each vertex once. Um, so it's O of V plus E. And we'll talk about, so one thing to notice is this is O of V plus E. We'll see that Dijkstra's has a little bit of a larger runtime, which is why we don't just always use Dijkstra's. But same runtime as DFS. Okay, so I've been alluding to uh, this idea of having this weighted graph and how can we find the shortest cost path. So um, some good examples of this in the real world are sometimes, you know, instead of flying nonstop from here to New York, it might actually be cheaper to stop in Chicago or something. So if you care more about money versus the length of time, like you might want to stop in Chicago um, and save a couple hundred dollars on your ticket. Does anybody else have any other examples of like a real world graph where you care, where each edge has a certain weight and you might care about minimizing the length of the edge versus the number of places you visit? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, um, the example is if you have a you know, map of a city, you might want to weight each edge by the length of time that takes to traverse it because it's very different going up uh, doing you know, one mile on the street that's 
um, in San Francisco. I don't know if you've seen pictures of it, but it looks like this because it's so steep. Like, you know, one vertical mile, that is very different from one mile on a normal street, right? So you might not want to take that street if you're trying to minimize the amount of time. Great example. Does anybody else have any other ideas? Um, another example might be if your um, like how servers handle requests. Sometimes, like depending on the latency of that server, uh, you might want to go to more servers that have fewer that have shorter latency overall, sort of thing. So that's another example. Okay. Um, so as an example of why BFS is not a good enough solution, um, can anybody see what BFS from A to F would find? Which path it would find? Yeah, A to E to F. Um, okay, so BFS would find this path, right? Okay, so that cost is nine. Anybody see a better path? Yeah, uh, actually here, over there. Do you have your hand up? Okay, so A, D, G, H, F. So instead of nine, that cost is only six. So sometimes making more stops is cheaper overall, depending on your graph. So with this graph, it's pretty easy because we can just look at it. Um, but you, know, you can imagine with hundreds or thousands of vertices and edges, it might be a, become a lot more difficult. So. This guy, um, Dijkstra, is, came up with an algorithm that basically fixed this problem. So Dijkstra is a pretty big deal in computer science. Um, he won the Turing Award, which is sort of like the Nobel Prize for computer science. So if you look at the list of people who won the Turing Award, like, it's very impressive. Um, uh, my favorite it's probably, it's not true, but like my favorite anecdote about Dijkstra is you can see his name is IJK, which is why, which as this legend goes, that's why loop counters in CS start with IJK, right? It's all because of this guy. So he's very influential um, in computer science. So he saw this problem and developed an algorithm to find the minimum weight path or the minimum cost path between a pair of vertices in a weighted directed graph. So it solves the um, idea of, okay, we need to find the shortest uh, or least cost path from a given vertex. So it's not like it will, so this algorithm won't necessarily find the least cost path between, like to find, you know, it's, it's good at finding A to F and A to E, but like to find B to F, you'd have to run this algorithm again, sort of thing. Uh, the basic premise about it is we're gonna, Every time we see a new vertex, um, we're going to compute its cost in terms of the previous vertices that we've seen. So instead of having a queue where we just blindly and queue neighbors, we're going to keep track of the edge costs to get to those neighbors. And then as we go through this algorithm, we'll update those costs and eventually we'll have the least cost path. Okay. Um, so the pseudocode is a little bit more involved. Um, the idea is basically, we start at B1, um, you know, A in our example, and that has a cost of zero because we're already here. And we don't know any information about any other nodes. So we're just gonna say they have an infinite cost. Then we're going, so we've seen you know, using a queue before, we're going to use a priority queue because we want to order based on the edge costs. So we're gonna use a priority queue of vertices ordered by cost. Uh, and then while the PQ is not empty, we're going to dequeue the least cost node and mark it as visited. Then we'll look at the costs to get to all the other neighbors and um, say, okay, so the cost to get to all of these neighbors is at most the cost it took for me to get to this node that I'm at right now, plus the edge cost to get to my neighbor. Right, so if it took, if 
I'm at node B and it took 7 to get to B and there's an edge of length 2 to get to C, then the total cost to C would be at most 9. Then, it, so this cost might be less than our current cost for that node. So if it's less than that current cost, then we would, you know, change, we would NQ that, new, that neighbor with the lower cost. And if it's greater than, we just ignore it because maybe we can get to C with a cost of 8 instead of a cost of 9. So we would just let C lie with 8. Um, and then we need to remember which vertices we had to traverse in order to make that path again. What questions do you have about this? We'll do an example too, but. Okay. So, okay. Um, we have, uh, so let's say we're trying to get from A to F, our favorite example. So in order to do this, we'll have a certain coloring scheme, which is that yellow means it's n queued. So, you know, we start our algorithm only in queuing our start node with cost zero. And then white is nodes we know nothing about. So for all we know, like, maybe there's not even a way to get to those nodes in this graph, starting from A. And then green it are the nodes that we've visited and processed and, you know, dequeued from our priority queue. Okay. So our first step is we want to get all of the neighbors of A, and we want to NQ them into our Q. Right. So does anybody know what our Q, what our Q should look like after we or our priority Q should look like after we've you know, processed A? So we have, okay, D1 and uh, B2. Exactly. So we know that it's possible to get to B with at most cost 2 from A because we can just travel this edge, and we know that we can get to D with at most cost 1 by just traveling this edge. So you would then, you know, update both of these costs and say, okay, my previous is back to A at this point. Okay, what's the next node we're going to look at? Any ideas? Yeah. We're going to look at D because D is lower cost than B. And those are two things in our queue. Okay. So yeah, we'll look at D. Um, what, so what are the neighbors of D? Heard C. Okay. F. E and G. Okay. Um, so what would the cost of C be, for example, that we would NQ? Okay, I heard some people say two. Any other ideas? I'm seeing some people say three. So you're totally right that the cost to get from D to C is two. However, it took us one to even get to D, right? So since we're trying to find the distance from A to F, like, so we want to find the distance starting at A. The cost to get from A to C would be 3. How do people feel about that? <coughs> okay, so D would be in Q, or C, sorry, C would be in Q with 3. F would be in Q with 9, right, so 1 plus 8, and then G would be in queued with 5, and E would be in queued with 3. So 
So 1 plus these edge costs because the cost to get to D was 1. So, okay, what, um, so what is the next node to be DQ'd? How many people think B? How many people think, okay. How many people think C? How many people think E? How many think, people think G? F? What about I? Okay, not I. Um, yeah, so I think you all got it right that um, B is the next one because it, its current proposed cost is two. Okay? Um, so, we look at B. What um, so? What are the neighbors of B? D and E. Do we need to do anything with D? No. So we ignore D because we visited D. What about E? What should we do about E? <coughs> Do we want to change the priority or keep it the same? How many people think change? How many people think keep the same? Yeah, so we want to keep it the same because uh, 2 plus 10 is 12, which is a lot bigger than 3. So the fastest way to get to E is clearly not through B. Okay. Um, so what, what are we going to look at next? Or, well, it's actually a tie between C and E. So let's just pick C because that's the way the slides are written. So, okay. C points to H and F. H goes in with priority of what number? 16, right. 3 plus 13. Um, what about F? Do we, how many people think we want to change the priority of F? How many people think we want to keep it the same? Okay, so non-participation, it's, okay. Um, yeah, like elections have better turnout. You all can do better. <laughs> okay, so let's try that again. How many people think that we should change, so we're looking at C, how many people think that we should change the priority of F? Awesome, okay, how many people think it should stay the same? Cool, great job. Yeah, so because, so our new priority, we know that if we go through C, we can get there with a cost of eight, right? Three plus five, and eight is less than nine. So that's why we want to update F. Okay. So now we're looking at E. E's neighbors are D, or sorry, E's neighbors are G. Do we want to update G? How many people think yes? How many people think no? Okay, exactly. So, okay, we ignore updating G. Um, the next thing to be DQ'd is H. Sorry, the next thing to be DQ'd is G. Um, should, so, G's neighbors are F. How many people think we should update F? How many people think we should leave it? Okay, so 5 plus 1, so F now becomes 6. And then our next thing that we DQ is F. So therefore, we found that it has priority of 6, cost 6. And that path is F to G, or sorry, A to D to G to F, if we trace back the previous pointers. Yeah. The How are you storing the... <laughs> okay, so the question is, how do we know that, like, the previous pointers are... You know, F's previous is G and G's previous is D, et cetera. Um, so this is a question you'll have to think about on your homework. You should store them because otherwise that step isn't possible. Um, and there are lots of different ways to do it. So just be creative. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, I'm having a hard time hearing you. Yeah. 
the question is like everything you, you were calculating a new priority, how are you finding that new cost? And so what you're doing is you say like, I don't care how I got to where I currently am, but I know that that cost is like seven, let's say. And that might be it because the cost is just number two, three edges or ten edges or however many edges. But the cost to get here was seven. So if I have an edge, so if I'm looking at my neighbor and that has an edge weight, the cost to get there would be seven plus that edge. And there might be a factor rate that for like $3 or $23 or where we don't necessarily always want to have a new priority. Yeah, so the question is like every time you see a new neighbor, you're adding all the costs plus that new neighbor. Yes, yeah, so you want to keep track of like the entire cost to get to where we currently are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, so the question is like, okay, we're using infinity. Infinity doesn't really exist in a computer program. Like, computers don't like infinity. So how would we represent that? Um, in C++, actually in every programming language, there's this concept of like the maximum int and the minimum int. So minimum int is like the lowest negative integer value and the maximum int is the highest integer value. So there are constants that represent, basically. I mean, it's not positive infinity, it's something like two billion, but that's generally how computer scientists represent infinity. Yeah? Yeah, so the question was, okay, so our, our pseudocode said while the PQ is not empty, um, so this data code finds, or like, so why did we stop when we found F instead of keep going? So this data code would find the shortest path from A to every single uh, vertex in the graph. Um, the, but at this point, now that we've found F, we know that there won't be a shorter path. Because like, if we were to go through, a sh if there were a shorter path, assuming that all your edge weights are non negative, like you'd have to go through additional edges and so those edges can only add to the costs, right? Which So we know that there can't be any faster path to F. So this is an optimization we can make because we knew we were specifically going from A to F instead of like just find the shortest path or the least cost path from A to every other vertex in the graph. Cool. Great catch. What other questions do you all have about Dijkstra's? So um, a couple of just comments on Dijkstra's algorithm. It's something that's called a greedy algorithm, which is an algorithm that makes local optimal choices in the hopes that that leads to a global optimal. Um, so specifically, we're taking what seems to be the best, uh, like we're looking at each vertex and saying that the one with the smallest cost is the one that we should look at next. And so we're, and then we're hoping that that overall leads to like finding the shortest paths overall, right? So that's an example of a greedy algorithm. Um, if you're interested in greedy algorithms, you should take CS161 because they talk about those a lot. Uh, it also, the re, so this might seem like, okay, we just did this. It did find a shortest path. Maybe that was just luck. Maybe I created this example in such a way where you know, it just worked. Um, but it works because it, always maintains two properties about your priority queue. So for every vertex that we've visited, the current, or that we've you know, marked as in our PQ, the current recorded cost is the lowest cost for that vertex from the source vertex. So once we've visited and dequeued a node from our priority queue, there can't be a faster way to get to that node. Because anything faster would involve like all the other costs in the priority queue are greater than that cost to that visited node. So like going through any other node would be a greater cost, right? And then for all of the unvisited vertices, so the ones that are still in the priority queue, those uh, priorities in the priority queue, like those costs that we've you know, tentatively assigned, that's the current shortest path if you only look at vertices that we've actually visited. 
So it kind of maintains those two properties. And that's why this works. This is why Dijkstra is a really cool guy, because he figured all this out. Okay. So, okay. Um, would you, why don't you try doing Dijkstra's with a partner to, um, with this graph and see how it goes. Okay, so let's um, go through how Dijkstra's algorithm would handle this graph. So what is originally in our PQ when we start the algorithm? Which vertex starts off in our PQ? Yeah. Yep, E0. So we always just start off with the um, starting node um, with priority of 0. So, Okay. <coughs> Um, so then we're going to DQ it, and we're going to say, okay, this one's visited. So it's DQ'd. What are its neighbors? B and G, yeah. So B goes in with priority what? 80. All right, so this edge here. And then G goes in with priority of 30. Okay, so which one do we DQ? G, because G has lower cost. Okay, so we'll DQG. Okay, um, so what do we NQ after looking at G? D with one. Oh, so what's the, the what's the weight for one uh, D? Wait, sorry, I couldn't hear that. So D gets NQ'd with priority what? Yeah, so D gets NQ'd with 150 because it took 30 to get to G, and then G saying, okay, it takes another 120 to get from g to d so then that's to a total cost of 150. okay so we'll say this one's zero this one's 30. so okay so what do we dq next how many people think we dq b next how many people think we dq g next how many oh sorry totally didn't see a um yes so Okay, what do we NQ, sorry, we're still looking at G, so what would we NQ A with? Yeah, 50, 30 plus 20. Okay, so which one are we doing next? 
Okay, so we visit A, DQ it. Okay, what costs do we want to what what nodes do we want to NQ? Yeah, so okay, so A had cost 50, so we can update B to be cost 70 because 70 is less than 80. So we'll change this and say it's 70. Okay, any other nodes we want to look at from A? D with cost 130. Sorry, we've already in QD, 130. Okay. So which, which node are we looking at next? B with cost 70. Okay. So from B, what nodes will we look at? Yes, F. So that F would have cost 80. Okay. Um, so then, for, can you all see the green okay? Okay. How is this? Better? Okay. So here, D currently is in with 130. F. This looks a lot better on my screen. 80. Okay, and these have cost 0, 30, 50, and 70. Okay. So which node do we visit and so which node do we visit now? Can I say that again? Yep, so D has cost 130. So I think I didn't write down F. So F has cost 80. We're done. Okay, so then D has cost 120 because 80 to 40. Um, any other nodes we need to add to our priority queue? C with cost what? So D has cost 120. So C has cost what? Yep, 130. Okay. Um, so what do we DQ now? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So, sorry, backing up. Hold on. Um, I don't know if I can erase. Apparently I can't erase. So, okay, so from F, we were at 80. So F would NQC with priority 150 and NQD with priority 120. And then we would DQD because D 120 is less than 150. Yeah, exactly. So okay? Um, and so we'd update C to be 130 because one once we look at D, 120 plus 10 is 130, which is less than 150. Yeah. Um, so we look, so question is when we were at B, okay, I'll answer anyway for people, um, who probably have the same question. So the question is, okay, we were at B and there was a path from B to A that cost 20. So shouldn't we have looked back at A? And the answer to that is you don't want to look back at A because we've already visited A. So, and you can see like 70 plus 20 is 90 and 90 is greater than 50, which is good. Like dextrose is working. So, okay. So, okay. D is 120. So then C would be 130, right? And then H would be 150. How do people feel about this example? What questions do you have about Dijkstra's in general?
I think your question is, um, do you think it's a B and C? And then, if you go to B and all C, it would cost more than C, what would you do? Um, so then all the nodes are going to be in your priority system. So, um, you're always going to, like, If you know the cost to get from B to D is a hundred, and the cost for I don't like a thousand or something, you might like not look at D for a long time until you find a different path. So it's very possible that you could go like multiple opt outs. That's why that group doesn't find the sort of path to the upper edges if you find something else. So that's like that's a really common thing. Cool, great question. Yeah, the question is how, is how are we keeping track of the path? Basically, we would have to have some sort of way to store, like to associate each node with like the, the um, previous vertex that got it to that cost. So for example, when we were looking at, um, when we were processing E, we would have to mark for B and G that we like traveled, you know, we're enqueuing them with 70 and that cost comes from they previously were at E. Yeah, so you have to come up with some, it's a lot like BFS, we have to come up with some way to keep track of like, okay, I'm enqueuing this because of this previous vertex. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, would it be correct to say that the priority queue has the least cost that we know of at that time? Yes. So that's 100%. That's a really good way to think about it. So only looking at vert vertices that we've visited, so like DQ from the priority queue, all of the costs in the priority queue are accurate for those, like if you were to make a path only using those visited vertices. Exactly. Um, yes, yeah, so that's a question you'll have to think about for your homework. Sorry, good try. Okay. Any, what, yeah. Oh, yeah, so the answer in this case, so we went from like E to G to A to, here's, B to F to D to C to H, which has cost C, or which is path C, and has cost 150. Okay. So remember when I was talking about um, BFS and DFS? Does anybody remember what that runtime was? Yeah, O, V, plus E, because we looked at each vertex once and each edge once. Um, Dijkstra's is a little bit different. Uh, so the way priorities, priority queues work, since I know that you have all uh, been working on your priority queue, you've probably noticed that the best that we could do is have an NQ and DQ and change priority of log N, right? And so your heap priority queue had that runtime. There's no way to do those in constant time, uh, like to do all those operations in constant time. So um, basically every time you have to update the priority queue, that's a log V operation instead of an O of one operation, which is why you get into like O of V log V plus O of E log V, which assuming that your graph is connected, that means that every vertex would have at least one edge coming from it. You can write that as O of E log V. Um, so it has to do with every time you, so every time you're like at a current node, you're looking at all the edges of that node, right? And so then for every edge, you end up looking at the priority queue and you might have to change the priorities um, like every time you look at an edge. So that's, and changing a priority is a log V operation because your priority queue has size V. 
Great question. Um, yeah, if you're interested in all of this, like 161 is a great class to take. They go over graph algorithms and big O in great detail. Um, but the moral, like the point of this slide is that basically Dijkstra's is a really good algorithm for the problem that's solved. But if you're just trying to find a path between two nodes, it's better to use BFS or DFS because it has a faster runtime. Okay. Okay. Um, so let's talk about A star, which is like Dijkstra's plus plus. So uh, let's say we were trying to find a path from A to C, and let's say this is you know some pit of despair that you can't go through, right? So if we were does anybody have any ideas of what Dijkstra's algorithm will look like? Like, will Dijkstra's algorithm, so Dijkstra's algorithm, yeah, if it could, it would just ideally go here. But it doesn't know to do that, right? So um, basically what happens is you end up with, like, it will explore all over here and, like, up here and over here before it gets to C. Right, because it's looking at, it's going to branch out in all directions. It doesn't know that, like, hey, my target's over here, so I should maybe, like, try to try to move this way. So the problem with this is that the only information we're taking into account with Dijkstra's is the known distance from, uh, like, the starting vertex to the current vertex we're at, right? So we know the distance from A to B. We are just doing that. Those were the costs we were keeping track of. If Dijkstra's were smart enough, you could have it take in um, a distance, like you could have it maybe try to guess the distance from B to C based on some sort of heuristic. Okay? So, like if we're trying to get from, you know, here to here, we actually end up going backwards, which isn't good. And you can also see this um, here. So if we were to try to go from like, Make sure this one's extra. This is what your next homework looks like. So if we're trying to go from here to here, see how it's like going way up into the corner? Like there's just no way that's going to be the fastest path, right? Like we're all the way, you know, over here and over here. Like that is a lot of extra work, right? So um, the idea is, okay, Let's try to give the algorithm some hint about this unknown distance from B to C. And maybe that can let us make some more intelligent decisions than just blindly walking in every direction. So in order to do this, we're going to use something called a heuristic, which um, basically is, some, is a metric that's like a guess for, for some unknown distance. So obviously, if we knew the distance, we could just use that. But that's what we're trying to solve. So that's not a great solution. Um, so this, essentially, it's just trying to come up with, like, a pretty accurate guess. And what's important about these heuristics is they need to always underestimate the cost or, like, be, right, be, you know, exact. It can't ever overestimate the cost. So a good example would be if you're trying to, you know, if you're implementing Google Maps and you're trying to find the least cost path from San Francisco to New York, well, you know that the like absolute shortest path is going to be the actual, you know, straight line distance from San Francisco to New York because there's not any faster way to do it than going in a straight line, right? So that would be like one example of a heuristic. Um, they actually use heuristics and other things too, like um, there are heuristics to try to predict if a given piece of email is spam or not, and that might look at the sender, the number of recipients, um, keywords, like if it includes the words Nigerian prince, probably spam, um, right? Uh, so that is an example of a heuristic used elsewhere in computer science. Um, but there, for A star, we need to come up with a heuristic to guess distance. And then you'll hear the phrase admissible heuristic, super fancy term. All that that means is that we need to and we can never overestimate the distance because if we overestimate the distance, then we can get into a case where we're wrong about our, um, like we're going in the wrong direction, right? We pick a less optimal path. So 
Um, basically, how A star works is the whole A to B thing is exactly the same as Dijkstra's, but going from B to C uses this extra heuristic. So you want to factor both in into our priorities because we want to look at the nodes that we think have a shorter distance to our target before we look at the nodes that have a bigger distance to our target. Right, like we don't want to walk backwards to go somewhere. Um, okay, what questions do you have about like this concept? Yeah. Okay, that's a great question. So, like, how do you pick a heuristic? Um, basically, you have to know something about your graph in order to pick a heuristic. Because if you don't know anything, it's very difficult to, like, you can't make a heuristic. It relies on some sort of information. So with the Google Maps example, um, we knew that, like, the, you can't go between two places any faster than a straight line distance. But if we are instead mapping Wikipedia, like, that doesn't work because you don't have this concept of, like, a straight line. So it really depends on getting information about your graph and knowing something about your graph. So as an example of trying to come up with a heuristic, what do you think would be a good heuristic for this graph? Where, you know, traveling to a square, you can only travel, you know, this way or like in this direction or this direction. You can't do diagonals. Yeah. Um, if we knew the coordinates of each square, mm -hmm. Yeah, so one suggestion is, okay, like we could use, um, it's called Euclidean distance. This is a thing you learned in geometry probably where it's like square root of x minus, you know, x1 minus x2 plus, I don't know if you've all seen that, but, um, you know, basically like if you were to draw a straight line distance. So yeah, we can totally do that. That formula is a little bit tricky to remember. Is there a simpler heuristic that we could use? Like what is the minimum, like if I'm here and I want to get here, what is the minimum number of squares I need to walk? Somebody say something? It sounded right. I just couldn't hear it quite. In the back, are you raising your hand? Okay. Like, yeah. Yep, exactly. So, like, if we're here and we need to get here, we could just say, okay, we have to, like, at most, you know, at least we're going to have to walk all the way this way and all the way this way because we can't do any diagonals. Um, Euclidean distance would also work, so that's the you know, straight line distance, but this is just a little bit easier to implement. Um, specifically, it makes this slide look a lot better because I don't have to do all the you know, straight line distances. So yeah, we would say, you know, in this case, it would take six to get to C from here because you'd have to walk two this way and four this way. Um, okay, so really quickly, uh, basically the, so this is Dijkstra's code, this is A star, Dijkstra is A star. You aren't changing a whole lot. The big differences are where you see cost and priorities before, you would now have to inc incorporate that heuristic. So, you know, we're going to have cost plus heuristic, you know, before we were storing the original node priority zero, now we're going to store the heuristic. And then when we're enqueuing, we need to incorporate the heuristic to get from that node to the end goal. Great. Um, thank you so much, and have a great day.